So with that in mind, I'd invite you to turn to Job chapter 15. We're going to be looking at seven chapters. And while you're turning there, I want to tell you a little bit about what's happened to Job so far. We are introduced to Job and he is rich. He is powerful. He has all of his kids in good health. And then in just a few moments, he loses it all. Not only that, he has to bury every one of his kids. I mean, just unimaginable amount of suffering. And just when things can't seem to be much worse, all of a sudden Job is stricken with an illness and he is on his deathbed and suffering immensely. So most people know the story of Job and know that part. But what most people don't understand about the book of Job is that it's 42 chapters long. And the first two chapters and the last chapter are written in prose, and the middle 39 chapters are all written in verse, and Job is first and foremost a poem. And we don't often know that. And not only that, but when Christians are asked about what is in all of the chapters in between that are the poetry of this book, most Christians don't know. So we've been going through each section of the poem. And last week we began with section one, and we talked about how it realizes, we realized that Job, the book, offers companionship instead of answers in our suffering. And we talked about how much better the church would be if it was a companion rather than rushing in with answers to people who are hurting, who are suffering, and who are in pain. So today we're going to look at the second section of this poem, seven chapters in the middle from chapter 15 to 21. And what's happening here is Job is suffering, he's on his deathbed, and he's surrounded by his three closest friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. These three are his closest friends, and Job, because this is a poem, Job is a metaphor for Israel this whole nation that's undergone this tragic amount of suffering. And these friends are actually a metaphor for religion. They represent religion in this story. And when you read this story closely and this poem closely, what you discover is that these three friends aren't actually friends. They're the villain in the poem, which means that Job is a poem about how religion is the villain. And you can imagine what's going on here because what we see time and time again in the middle 39 chapters is Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar tell Job, Job, you're suffering because you sinned. And Job holds on to and maintains his innocence throughout 39 chapters as his friends tell him, you're the reason you're suffering. Repent. Tell God you're a sinner and God will give you reprieve. So with that, we jump into the second section of the poem, which begins in Job 15, where Eliphaz speaks to Job. He says to Job, by maintaining his innocence, Job, you are undermining religion and crippling faith in God. Sin has seduced your mind. Your tongue flaps with deceit. Your mouth condemns you, not I. Your own lips testify against you. Will you scorn religion's comforts and reject our indulgent advice? The wicked man's life is a torment. His days are anguish and pain. In his ear is the voice of terror. In his mouth is the taste of death. For he shook his fist at God and dared to revolt against him, charging at him headlong behind the spikes of his shield. For the fate of the wicked is barren and his hopes are consumed by fire. His womb is heavy with suffering. He gives birth to sorrow and pain. So what Eliphaz is telling Job, representing religion, is that if Job is good, then God will bless him. But if Job is bad, well, that's when you have suffering and pain. And the only way to avoid suffering and pain is to repent and ask for forgiveness from God. So in other words, what Zophar, excuse me, what Eliphaz is telling Job in this uh, situation and in this part of the poem is that religion promises that the religious will be rewarded. Job, if you're devoted to the religion, God will get you back on track. Don't you remember life before all of this suffering, Job? Don't you remember what it was like before? Go back to being religious, admit your sin, and God will restore you. This is still true today. Religion still promises that the religious will be rewarded. All you need to know that this still happens today is you need to sit down and watch a Christian movie. Just about every Christian movie I encounter begins with a horrendous amount of suffering. There's a guy, we'll just call him Guy, and he goes through life and his football team is losing every game, his dog has died, he's a drunk, and his wife and his marriage is falling apart. People keep telling him that he needs to give his life to God, but he's like, nah, I'm not into that God stuff. And then about 66% of the way through the movie, Guy decides, oh, maybe I should give this God thing a shot. 
And so all of a sudden his football team starts winning. His wife and his marriage improved significantly. He gets a new dog. I mean, everything works out for this guy. And it's all built on the premise that religion tells us and promises us that the religious will be rewarded. If you're devoted to religion, then God will bless you. And if you're not, well, watch out. So that's what Eliphaz says to Job in the first part of section two of this poem. Job then responds to Eliphaz. And remember, Job is suffering immensely. He is on his deathbed. And he says to Eliphaz, enough. I have heard enough. I am sick of your consolations. How long will you pelt me with insults? Will your malice never relent? I too could say such things if you were in my position. I could bury you with accusations and sneer at you in my piety, but I speak and my pain keeps raging. I am silent and have no relief. For disaster has worn me out and suffering has made me wither. In God's rage, God hunted and caught me. God cracked my bones in God's teeth. I was whole. God ripped me apart, chewed my body to a pulp. And where now is my hope? My piety or my religious devotion? Who cares? Who will see it? It will follow me to the grave and lie in the dust beside me. So Job hears religion making all of these grand promises. If you are devoted to religion, then God will bless you. And Job says, nah, I don't think so. For Job, religion has not kept its promises. He's angry with religion because he was told throughout his life that if he offered sacrifices, if he repented, that God would take care of Job. And here's Job not being taken care of. Job is accusing Eliphaz and ultimately religion of not keeping the promises it so eloquently espouses. And Bildad, who represents religion, his second friend, Bildad hears all of this and becomes intensely angry, intensely defensive. And he says, Job, how long will you lay these word snares? Be sensible, then we will talk. Why do you treat us like morons and act as if we were cows? Should the earth be changed for your sake? And mountains move at your bidding? It is true, the sinner is snuffed out. His candle flickers and dies. All the sinner's roots are withered. All his branches are bare. He disappears from the earth. Not a trace is left behind him. This is what happens to the godless. This is the sinner's doom. So Bildad objects and he reveals that he really, really, really believes that the wicked are punished that the righteous will eventually get the greater reward in the end, and all Job has to do is repent, and he will be restored. But notice how Bildad feels incredibly threatened by Job's accusations. When Job says, I'm not sure the righteous do get rewarded. I'm not sure the wicked do get punished. Bildad is very threatened in what he believes and how he believes it. And what this reveals is something rather stunning. Bildad reveals that all of religion is threatened if there is no punishment reward system. If you take away the idea that religious devotion will eventually get you something else, something better, then religious people freak out. If you don't believe me, then let's go back to 2002 and may I introduce you to a man named Bishop Carlton Pearson, who at one time had one of the largest churches in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, Bishop Carlton Pearson was an up-and-coming rising star in evangelical Christianity, and he did what he was supposed to do as a pastor. He kept studying the Bible. He kept asking God for guidance. And all of a sudden, he started to look at the scriptures and started to look at the way that all of Christianity was set up and said, something's not right here. And he believed that God told him that there was no such thing as hell. And so all the way back in 2002, Bishop Carlton Pearson stood up in front of his mega church and he said words like this, I believe that people go through hell, but not to hell. He then cited Psalm 139, or excuse me, 136, in it, which says, oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good for his mercy endures forever. And he read that in front of his congregation and he asked the question, how can mercy endure forever and hell endure forever? One would cancel out the other, right? 
And the question is, when, when a Bishop Pearson stands up in front of his megachurch congregation, the question becomes, well, how would people respond? You would assume that people would be like, there's no hell. This is great news. We're all going to heaven. Hallelujah. But that's not the reaction that happened at all. Christianity Today wrote about it four years after this began, and just four years after uh, Bishop Pearson was preaching these words, his church had to close because no one was showing up anymore. Christianity Today writes about it the day after the church closed for the final time, when it writes, Higher Dimensions, which was Bishop Pearson's church. Higher Dimensions slide began about four years ago when Pearson began preaching a form of universalism that alienated his Pentecostal evangelical followers. His, quotes, gospel of inclusion, that Christ died for the sins of the world and therefore the whole world will be saved, denied the classic Christian belief that salvation involves turning from sin and accepting God's forgiveness through faith in Jesus. Now, what's interesting about all of this is this reminds me of Bildad's conversation with Job. Job, accept that you're a sinner and God will then deliver you from this suffering. And here's Bishop Pearson saying, actually, I think God's already delivered us and there is no punishment lurking and people left in droves. So when we consider heaven and hell, there's a question that I want to ask you that I think is important for us to ask. Is your faith threatened if people don't go to hell? If the answer is yes, then I have to ask you, why? Eventually, the answer is going to get back, well, I need a punishment reward system in my faith. And if God doesn't have that, then I'm not sure I'm down with God. Another way to ask this question that's equally important is, is your faith threatened if everyone goes to heaven? If Jesus showed up and said, hey, everyone, I'm coming back in 200 years from now, but I want you to know everyone's going to make it, would that threaten your faith? And if that, the answer is yes, then it shows that your faith is dependent on a punishment reward system. Bildad exemplifies that faith. He's saying we need a punishment reward system to believe in God. And Job hears that and Job objects. He asks the question to Bildad, do you think I have lost my mind? Am I the one who is raving? Are you sure that you have convicted me and justified my disgrace? When the plague brings sudden death, God laughs at the anguish of the innocent. Oh man, that verse is a challenge to read, right? When the plague brings sudden death, God laughs at the anguish of the innocent. If only my cry were recorded and my plea inscribed on a tablet, carved with an iron stylus, chiseled in rock forever, someday my witness would come, my avenger would read those words, my avenger would plead for me in God's court, and my avenger would stand up and vindicate my name. And Job discredits Bildad by saying, I want to tell you what I found about God. God is unjust. God is not a just God. And if we somehow had some other cosmic arbiter between us, that person would find that I am innocent and God is in the wrong because I have found from my own life that the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer. Now, if you're like me, you hear Job saying these words and you say, oh, that's a pretty big claim. God is unjust, Job. Where on earth do you get that idea? What evidence do you have to justify this accusation? And all of a sudden you start to read the story of Job with this accusation in mind and you know exactly where he gets it from. Job gets this accusation, this idea from his experience. Think about all of the suffering that Job has encountered. Think about burying not one, not two, but all of your children at the same time. And through all of that pain and heartache and suffering, Job says, I have found that God is unjust. Why would God allow me to suffer this way if God is in fact looking for some sort of admission of guilt? And when you look at this story and this poem 
And what it's trying to get you to ask, I think, is a very, very important question. The question this story is leading you toward is what happens when your experience contradicts your tradition? What do you do when you experience something that doesn't fit in all the nice, neat boxes that religion would tell you that life is supposed to fit into? What happens when there's a bunch of rules and then someone breaks the rules and they find a better life beyond the rules? I found a visual representation of this not too long ago on the internets, but here is clearly a sign that says no birds. Birds can't go here. Now you can imagine this sign struck great fear into the hearts of birds because they said, oh man, if we go there, we might die. So let's stay away from it. Let's stay far away from this sign and we'll see what happens. We'll stay safe over here. But then there was that one bird. He was a revolutionary, a visionary. And he said, well, what happens if we go past the sign? And all the other birds freaked out and said, no, 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 don't go past the sign. And this bird said, screw you, I won't do what you tell me. And here he is proving that life exists beyond the sign. This bird is a national treasure. I mean, this bird challenged the status quo and survived. Let me tell you another example. How many of you have gone to a restaurant or an eatery and you've seen a sign like this? We welcome all races, all religions, all countries of origin, all sexual orientations, all gender. We stand with you and you are safe here. And you think, wow, it's so nice to see a restaurant step out in faith and tell the world that we welcome everyone here. And then you look at the same store and in the same store, there's a different window and there's a different sign that says restrooms are for customers only. Well, they welcome everyone as long as they can afford to be there. We like everyone except the poor people, right? It all of a sudden says, are you really welcoming if you don't welcome everyone? Or lastly, I want to tell you a story that took place last summer when my family got to take an amazing trip to Disney World in Orlando, Florida. We went to the Magic Kingdom one night and we watched this show and it was, it was a show, right? Fireworks, all the Disney songs, they had all these characters. They lit up the castle with environmental projection. It was a moving show. And I think it's like 25 minutes long and probably around minute 15, they're going through the characters. We see Moana, we see Woody and Buzz, we see Mickey Mouse, everything's going great. Everybody's into it. We're all packed around this castle, just being blown away by the special effects. And then all of a sudden, Elsa shows up and starts singing Let It Go. And when Elsa starts singing about Let It Go, there was a couple that was probably in their early 20s that was standing next to me, and they loudly shouted, Goodbye, everyone. We don't do Frozen. Now, this happened so quickly, and it was so loud, and they left so quickly and made a statement. They raised their hand in the air and said, We're out. We don't do Frozen. And I wish I would have talked to them. Because it's almost like they were saying, we used to believe in Disney before it was all about corporate greed. We used to love this place that wasn't all about making more money and having hit songs. And then Frozen came along and those people sold out. To which I want to tell them, you know, Disney's always been about making money, right? Like they're really good at making money. They've always been about corporate greed. But these people felt they had to make a statement. Because Frozen, for whatever reason, contradicted what they believed Disney was supposed to be about. So this story asks the question, what happens when your tradition contradicts your experience? And you may disagree with where Job's author leads us, but do not disagree with what the premise is, because the whole story of Job is about how Job discards his tradition and trusts his experience. Job doesn't trust what the tradition told him, Instead, Job says, I have found a different kind of life than religion promised me. I'm going to trust that instead of what religion has told me. Now, this is essential to understand because when you look at the story of Job, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. Job's story is not about how he had lots of faith, there was suffering and he was tested, but he stayed firm to that faith and returned once the suffering was over. That's a story of confirmation, and that's not what this author's interested in all. Instead, this story is a story about transformation. And Job undergoes transformation by prioritizing his experience over his religious tradition and his religious teachings. Now, if this sounds dangerous to you, I will tell you that you are not alone because I would have freaked out if I heard this 10 years ago. 
This idea that people trust their experience over scripture and the religious tradition seems like it's just a chaotic nightmare. And when we talk about spiritual transformation and what leads us to override one or the other, there has been traditionally three paths to spiritual transformation. These are multi-denominational. A lot of people recognize that these three things are important, but they essentially say that tradition, scripture, and experience are what can lead us to ultimately to spiritual transformation. And because of that, a lot of people have talked about these three different paths like a three-legged stool. And each of these three things balance one another and hold each other up and ultimately lead us to sitting on spiritual transformation. Well, I'll tell you, for the majority of my life, I viewed spiritual transformation as something like this stool. But then I became familiar with the work of a woman named the Reverend Carolyn Metzler. Now, she lives in New Mexico currently, and this is a picture with her and her husband, Eric, and it's a little bit hard to find pictures of her online, um, but I found her website after some digging, and on her bio, she had this picture, but then she also had this picture. And let me tell you, I never find pictures of people like this when I'm doing research, and I was uh, thrilled. Not only that, but the caption for this picture on her website said, as my alter ego quotes Shadow Bell. So this comes straight from Shadow Bell, who is an ordained Episcopalian minister. <laughs> She looked at this stool metaphor and she said, nope, it's problematic. It's got a problem. And I'll tell you what she introduced instead has been life changing for me. Because she said the stool doesn't work because it emphasizes that all three of these paths are equal. A much better metaphor, Reverend Metzler says, is a tricycle. And on the tricycle, the back wheels are scripture and tradition and the front wheel is experience. Experience guides and moves tradition and scripture, and tradition and scripture balance experience. Think about how this gives a primacy to our experience above scripture and tradition, but still roots our experience in the tradition and in the scripture. All of a sudden, this is allowed to be bigger, and it's extremely helpful going forward because it allows you to trust your experience, and when these things contradict, it says, if you're not sure what to do, trust your experience. I think this has happened for many of us here at Paradox in the way that our tradition has viewed same-sex marriage. We were told throughout most of our lives that this was a sin, it was an abomination to marriage, it was reprehensible. And I will tell you, you've heard me tell this story before here at Paradox about how I did a word study in the Bible and I went through and I tried to see what the Bible really said and how I came away with the conclusion that the Bible does not condemn same-sex marriage in any way, shape, or form. And while that sounds good, I have to tell you, it's only part of the story. Because the real story is the experience I shared by getting to know queer people. I got to listen to their story and the discrimination they faced, the discrimination that I participated in. And when I heard stories and all of a sudden it wasn't this theological idea to debate from a tower, it began to change my mind more than scripture and tradition possibly could. Experience guides and moves the tradition, whereas scripture and tradition balance experience out. Now, Protestants have placed way too much emphasis on the scripture wheel. I've heard that Catholics place way too much emphasis on the tradition wheel. But ultimately what is going to help us going forward is to replace the emphasis on the experience wheel which moves and guides us forward. Job in this story discards his tradition and trusts his experience. Now how do you think religion feels about Job when he does this and when religion has this book of the Bible where Job actively discards his tradition? You're right, religion freaks out. They essentially say, no Job, no. You can't do that. And this voice is embodied in Job's last friend in this section, which is this friend Zophar. And Zophar references the lives of other people when he says, my mind is seething with anger and rage drives me to speak, Job. I have heard enough of your insults. You answer our wisdom with lies. Haven't you realized yet, how can you be so blind, that the sinner's joy is brief and lasts no more than a moment? Though the sinner rises as high as heaven and his forehead touches the clouds, he will drop to the ground like dung. Welcome to reading the Bible, ladies and gentlemen. 
He will drop to the ground like dung and rot like a fallen fruit. At the height of the sinner's fortune he falls, every disaster strikes him, the wrath of God assaults him, calamities rain on his head. Total darkness engulfs the sinner, fire from heaven consumes him, storms demolish his fields, floods sweep away his house, heaven reveals the sinner's guilt, and earth rises against him. This is the fate of the sinner, this is the rebel's reward. Don't you dare tell us that God is unjust again, Job. God will always reward the righteous and punish the wicked. And what Zophar embodies is that he says, look at all those people that you think are so happy, Job. Those non-religious people who appear to be happy are not actually happy. And they can tell you they're happy. You shouldn't trust them. Trust us as religion. We're telling you, all those atheists, all those agnostics, they don't know what true joy is if they don't have God in their lives. Well, what is this? I personally believe that this is ultimately a distrust of your experience. I personally have met Christians who are miserable. I personally have met atheists and agnostics who are truly happy. And religion tries to charge it and say, well, they're not actually happy. <laughs> you can't actually be happy apart from God. And this is what religion does to double down when people start to say, ah, I'm not sure about this whole thing. Now, what happens when religion asks you to distrust your experience? That's what Job gets to in the last part of this poem when he says, is my grievance against a man? No, it's against God. Why shouldn't I be impatient? Look at me, be appalled, clap your hands to your mouths. Why do the wicked prosper and live to a ripe old age? Their children stand beside them. Their grandchildren sit on their laps. Their grandchildren run out to play, skipping about like lambs, singing to drum and lyre, dancing to the sound of the flute. They end their lives in prosperity and go to their grave in peace. Yet they tell God, leave us alone. We can't be bothered about you. Why then should we pray to God? What good will it do for us to serve God? And what Job is saying here is he's accusing religion. You tell me that my life will be better. I've seen people outside of religion who have just as good of life as me. One man dies serenely, lapped in safety and comfort. Another dies in despair, his life bitter on his tongue. But both men rot in the ground and maggots chew on them both. The wicked man is tucked into the earth and flowers bloom on his grave. How hollow then is your comfort, Zophar? Your answers are empty lies. And what Job is doing is here is he's accusing religion of when religion tells us to distrust our experience, he's saying, if you don't tell us to trust our experience, then you are ultimately lacking empathy and you cannot practice compassion. Religion should never tell you to distrust your experience. And if we take the book of Job seriously, this is the dividing line between what is healthy religion and unhealthy religion. Unhealthy religion will constantly tell you that what you are experiencing and seeing is a lie. But healthy religion will lead one to trust their experience more than their tradition. This is what makes religion a healthy practice. That brings us to Paradox Church and the church body that we so desperately miss. Now what this reveals, what the book of Job reveals about Paradox Church, I think is really important. Because the truth is, and not a lot of people like to admit this, myself included. My ego really tr tries to prevent me from saying this out loud. But if paradox does its job really well, like really well, the best that we could do, then at that point, we'll know that church is non-essential. If we do the best that we can do, then you will come to realize that church is not an essential activity. Now, some people say, oh, I got to go to church because I got to go pray there. If we haven't taught you how to pray outside of church, we failed. Oh, man, I got to go to church so I can experience God. Oh, no. If you think God exists for one hour on a Saturday morning, we have messed up. I got to go to church so I can sing songs together in community. What about the community around you that you experience on a daily basis? When people rush in and try to say that church is essential, the truth is we're not. 
And if we do our job the best way that I believe God can ask us to do our job, it will help you to realize that church is not essential. And we help you to see that God is just as present outside of church as God is inside of church. We come together in church to recognize how to see and embrace Jesus Christ in everything we encounter. And so when it comes to what our job is, our job is to help you to see God on your daily basis in your mundane or exciting everyday life. The real measure of whether your religion is healthy, whether your church is healthy or not, is the question, how does my church help me to experience God when I am not at church? This determines whether we're successful or not as a church. If you can all of a sudden leave church saying, I have a greater appreciation for the ordinary. I have a greater appreciation for the little moments. I have a greater appreciation and reverence for the sacredness of all life. That's when we've done our job well. That's when we've done what we're supposed to do. And I will tell you that this is a hard question to answer during a pandemic. We have turned the difficulty level all the way up on the video game setting to try and see God in the midst of all this malarkey, right? This is about as hard as it gets. I don't know if you're working from home. It's difficult, right? I don't know what you do for a career. You may not be working from home. You may be an ICU nurse treating COVID patients. This is a difficult season, right? And my hope is that when you read the book of Job, you'll start to trust your experience and what you're seeing and saying, well, God must be here somewhere because this is sacred and God is here. And I know it's hard to see and it takes training and it takes discussion and that's why we still meet as a church. But ultimately, it's so that you can see God in every aspect of the work that you do. I know I grew up in Redlands and I always thought that Redlands was a nice town. I didn't think it was a great town. I always thought it would be better and cooler to live in a cool town, you know, somewhere like Los Angeles or something. But as I've grown older, I've come to really love this place. And the truth is, if you ever get the sense that God is in some other city or that it's better in some other city, our job as a church is to help you to see that this community is sacred and that God is just as present here as God is at that other community. And when we talk about this pandemic, and I know it's hard, I know it's hard to see God in the midst of all of this, but I believe you can experience God first and foremost around your dining table. Your dining table is the place where you can, can return to and have a good meal. And look, I like a frozen meal just as much as the next guy, but let me tell you, when you take the time to make a good meal, even if it's just for yourself, there's something so human about that moment that it only can be described as sacred. God is here at our dining table. God can be experienced in the tiniest moment, in the most routine activity. God can be found in all of these aspects of the pandemic. So my brothers, my sisters, my siblings, my hope and my prayer is that our church can help you to see God beyond and outside of church. Yes, we are being put to the test to the extreme during this time. But my hope is that you will learn to trust your experience more and more and to hold it in balance with your tradition and with scripture. And may you read the story of Job and see what it looks like for experience to be given priority. And may you trust that God is just as present in your life as God is in your pastor's life, as well as in Job's life. And may we as a church exist to help you see and embrace Jesus Christ in all that you experience. Amen.